Hey guys, welcome to Team Pandora. Roll the intro. Hey guys, welcome back. Here's my magic finger. This box came in the post. Believe it or not, it has six sides. Let's give it a snip. It's a Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. We picked this up from the Retroid website for 99 bucks. And there are a variety of designs. We've chosen the grey one that looks like a Super Nintendo. We don't actually get much in the box. Just the handheld, the manual, and a USB-C cable. Inside of the cable is purple, if that means anything. The manual is very bare bones. I prefer mine with a bit of meat. Yum. Sliding out the handheld, we're also given a display protector. At least now we don't have to look for one. This looks pretty damn nice. Yum. Along the top we have a micro HDMI, a USB-C for charging and data transfer, two buttons for volume, and the power button. On the bottom we have an audio jack, and this little thing here, which we open to find a micro SD hole. Yum. Before we get started, let's apply the display protector. Just gonna give it a wipe, place it on carefully, and we should be perfect. Ah, it's taking too long. Go, 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 go. So close. It's like one speck of dust in there. Ooh, nah, whatever. One of the most important things about handheld are the buttons and the D-pad. So these buttons here feel like purple violets, a good tactile feel. This stick here is very low to the unit, and it's like a slider more than an analog stick. This is in a very awkward position to use, but it might be good for C buttons on the N64. The D-pad is a classic design, very much like a Super Nintendo. It is clicky, but slightly squishy, just in an awkward position. The analog stick is quite similar to a Nintendo Switch. It wouldn't surprise me that they're using the same parts as Ambenic for these two. Home, Select and Start are very clicky, as are the L and R buttons. These are very light to push, as are the other two at the back here. In the hand it feels really good, especially if you use the analog stick. Using both sticks at the same time feels a bit weird, as is the placement of the D-pad. It's obvious that the primary input is the analog stick, so this is lightly targeted for N64 players. Before we turn it on, here are the specs. A quad-core unit with 2GB of memory. The specs here are extremely decent, especially at the $99 price point. Time to turn it on. Yeah, the rumble of this is not very rumbly. I have a vast array of adult toys. Would you like to borrow one? Ew, no I wouldn't. Uh, this takes a while to load up. That intro is very nice, but it took forever to boot up. Thankfully, this device has a sleep mode. So when it's first turned on, we'll need to go through a few settings, and then it'll ask if you want to install some of these apps. These files are on the unit itself, but once you install the Google Play Store, You'll be able to update these easily. And now we can choose our launcher. This is what starts up when you turn on the device. The top one is visually similar to Emulation Station, and the bottom one is just regular Android. So here's the top option, and we're greeted to blank. It's shocking to see that they gave us pretty much nothing on here, but we can add anything we wish from the Android Play Store, or emulators. This can look quite nice, but this is not an out-of-the-box experience. The only game that works out of the box is Free Civ 2. But thankfully, we have around 20 gigabytes of free space to fill this with applications and ROMs for RetroArch. Geekbench throws up these numbers. And for Vulkan too. Any application can be installed here, provided it's Android 9 compatible. Here's Slitherio. As you can see, the touchscreen's working fine. And Nyanko Dyson So. Battle Cats. Pussycat. If you want to use this as a guitar tuner, we can do that. There's a microphone in the unit. To get files copied across, we can either use a micro SD or USB cable. We can copy over music, videos, and ROMs for RetroArch. Let's move on to some gaming now with ScumVM. As mentioned before, the display is touchscreen, so we can literally point and click. If you prefer, you can use the analog stick. That's your choice. OpenBR is also installed, but you need to add the games and rebind the controls yourself. 
As we now have the games on the unit, we can set up the launcher. So to add some Genesis games, we need to show where to find the ROMs. Just point it to the correct path. Once you've found the correct folder, we'll give it a long push, and then select. Hit scan, and let it do its thing. Provided we're connected to the internet, this will also scrape the covers, and launch when you select the game. Before we play anything, we should update all of the things in RetroArch. If you're a bit lost, check some guides on YouTube. We'll leave you some down below. Time to test out some games. Here's the port of Outrun, Cannonball. Doom. Rick Dangerous. I don't know why, but this game has no sound. FB Neo works pretty well. We can also change options to have tap tear mode. That'll enable us to rotate the screen and play it vertically. Street Fighter 3, third strike. No slowdown, we're all good. Next up is Marvel vs. Capcom 2. This is on Naomi. To make this handheld sweat, we need to get out some Atomus Wave. Neo Geo Battle Coliseum. To get a steady frame rate, we need to lower the graphic settings. But it's playable. Killer Instinct Arcade you can forget. We say this time and time again. If you want to play this, get a PC. Moving on to Commodore Amiga, the Jim Power title screen is a bit slow. But don't worry, in game we get full speed, 50 FPS. There is some distortion when you move the screen, but if you set to integer scaling, Jim Power plays tremendously. Even our favourite dog, Cooley Coyote, has no slowdown. This is great to see in a handheld system. Here's the CD32 version. And it doesn't stop there, we also have some space balls running at 100% speed. For the PC Engine, we have Bomberman 93. Road Rash 3DO. Tennis for the Game Boy. Advanced Wars Game Boy Advance. Snake Rattle and Roll for the NES. Chrono Trigger for the SNES. RR64 for the N64. We can also use the native Android application Moopin. Just point it to the ROMs. All of the box art is scraped automatically, but we'll need to change the options to get everything running perfectly. Here's Cruising USA, running on the fast emulation default. Now let's push them boundaries. Mario Kart Double Dash for the GameCube. While not running 100%, this game is playable. Unlike F-Zero GX. As we can see, Dreamcast is pretty hit and miss. Now for some PlayStation 1. This is Ridge Racer Revolution in Swan Station. Let's try for the next gear. PlayStation 2, Capcom vs SNK2.
It's running this 2D game quite well. But if we try 3D, for example, Ridge Racer 5, nah, it's not happening. You can compromise with PlayStation Portable instead. As the aspect ratio of a PSP is 16.9, it'll have black bars on the top and bottom. But on the flip side, we're getting pretty decent PSP performance. There are slight hiccups here and there, but that's without frame skip and messing with any settings. Next up, Sega Saturn. This is Sega Rally running on Yaba Sanjiro 2. Virtua Fighter 2. All of the previous systems were using this handheld power alone. But if we wanted to, we could use Steam Link or any other streaming service. The Wi-Fi is capable enough and the latency stays quite low. So this is connected to my main PC and we can play any game in my Steam library. We can also branch that out to any emulators that are installed on the system. Here's Iron Fury and King of Fighters 13. So this unit also has a micro HDMI port. If we hook that up to the TV, we can play everything on the big screen. As this needs to scale up the screen, we do get slightly slower performance. And for the Sega Saturn emulator, there's kind of an echo effect on the sound. Anything in RetroArch should be fine though. But the question we need to ask is why play it on the TV when it plays so much better on the handheld? Comparing this to handhelds of the same price point, the Retro 2 Plus is extremely powerful. N64, Dreamcast, PSP, all playable. Both units have similar button quality, but with the Retroid, it'll take a lot more effort to set up. Now it's time for the pros and cons. The touchscreen display is very bright, and the aspect ratio is a perfect compromise for playing retro and newer games. It's powerful and very affordable, and it feels great if you use the analog stick. On the flip side, it's not a pick up and play device. I prefer the D-pad if it's up the top, and as it's Android, we'll be getting a little input latency. If you want to play N64 or Android apps, the RP2 Plus may be the perfect handheld. That is, if you're okay with setting it up. While we play Turrican 2 on this thing, here's a big thank you to all of those on our Patreon. If you'd like to support our work, please consider joining. We do video reviews, tutorials, and we hack and crack the Pandora boxes as well as the A500 Mini. We also like to look cool mm -hmm. and eat cheesy wopsits. No. I am John Luke. And I'm Amy Chicken. And we'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra. Till next time. Young. <laughs>